Many of the materials you work with may be classified as hazardous. They may be dangerous and even deadly. That's why all spills, no matter how small, must be taken seriously. What is a hazardous material? It's a material that may endanger your life or health, the life or health of others, or cause damage to your facility or the environment. Examples include chlorine, methane, acids, and other chemicals and gases which you work with or come in contact with at work or in your home. In addition, hazardous materials include everyday items like pesticides, cleaners, gasoline, and paint thinner. To handle hazardous material spills, your organization has developed procedures to control spills and emergencies. To help understand your responsibilities, you need to know how to react. By acting quickly, you can protect yourself and others and, of course, prevent a spill from getting out of hand. That's what this program is all about. We can't possibly list all protective safeguards. So to properly prepare for a hazardous spill, you need to review your company's emergency plan, which provides protective equipment, cleanup equipment, supplies, and first aid supplies. You need to be trained before a spill occurs. Let's take a quick look at a typical emergency plan. The plan clearly explains what you should do or not do in the event of a hazardous spill. The plan includes phone numbers to call for help and a list of the protective gear equipment and cleanup materials you'll need. Protective equipment may include chemical resistant overalls, gloves and boots, encapsulating suits, face shields, hard hats and respirators. Learn how to properly use the equipment and know what equipment can and can't protect you for certain types of chemicals. For instance, some coveralls don't protect against strong corrosives so an encapsulated suit would be worn for cleaning corrosive spills. In the event of a large spill, you should wear the highest level of protection. Respirators provide protection from hazardous vapors and gases, but again, you need to know what type of respirators or respirator cartridges protect you from what type of chemicals. You must also be trained to properly use respirators and how to test them for proper seals before using them in an emergency situation. In an emergency, you have to have the right supplies and know how to use them. The type of supplies will depend upon the chemical used in your work environment. Maintain an adequate supply of these materials. The most common mistake is not having enough supplies to contain and control spills or leaks. The most important thing about first aid supplies is to make sure they are adequate for any emergency and, of course, where they're located. Okay, you're trained. You have adequate supplies, materials, and there's an emergency. A spill or major chemical leak. If you're the person who discovered the hazardous chemical spill, you're in charge until help arrives. What do you do? Well, first, don't panic. Then follow these simple rules. First, get away. Second, identify what you saw. Third, get help. Fourth, seal off the area and alert others. Fifth, look for injuries. Sixth, identify the hazard. Seventh, prepare a plan of action. Eight, get proper equipment and materials. Nine, contain the spill. And ten, clean up the spill. Okay, let's go back and look at each one of these steps in more detail, as these steps are your guidelines to safety when a hazardous spill or leak does occur. First of all, get away. The first thing you should do if you see or smell a hazardous spill is get away. Move a safe distance away and turn off any potential ignition sources if you can. This may seem like a very simple rule, but it's surprising how many people stop to take a closer look. Without proper protection, they could be easily disabled or injured. Any spill can be dangerous. If you don't know the hazardous material or how to properly deal with it, then stay away from it and wait for someone with more training or experience. 
Number two, identify what you saw. Don't go back to find out what you saw or smell. Just think for a second. What was it? Did you see a label on the container? Was it foaming or fuming? Was there a fire? What did it smell like? What color was it? What was it doing? Emergency crews need as much information as possible, and what you remember may save lives. Number three, get help. The next step is to get help. After all, no one should try to contain or clean up a spill alone. Follow proper notification procedures so you can get the right help in the shortest possible time. Number four, seal off the area and alert others. Keep other people away from the hazard. Warn your fellow employees of the dangers. Number five, look for injuries. If you find an injured person, get him or her to fresh air as soon as safely possible. Keep the victim warm and quiet and get medical treatment as soon as possible. Here again, you can see the need for following emergency procedures and know what type of first aid should be administered for specific emergencies. Don't become a casualty yourself. Don't try to retrieve a person from the spill area unless you're completely protected yourself. Number six, identify the hazard. What chemical is it? What are the dangers? There are several ways to find this out. The Material Safety Data Sheet, or MSDS, is required for every chemical you work with and can be obtained by asking your supervisor. The MSDS will tell you the name of the chemical, its hazards, and what to do in case of an emergency. Signs and labels help identify the hazardous material and how to deal with it. For example, container labels often explain proper procedures to take in the event of a spill or leak. A placard may identify the material as flammable, corrosive, or poisonous. Check the material. In certain situations, you may have to go into the spill area to identify the material yourself. If so, assume the worst. Use the buddy system and never go in without backup. Proper protection, such as encapsulated suits and self-contained breathing apparatus, may be required. Number seven, prepare a plan of action. Once you know the hazardous material you're dealing with, you need to decide what to do. Of course, following company procedures and emergency plans are required, but preparing a plan of action is simply anticipating problems, remembering what you're supposed to do, and properly coordinate all the tasks and people to do the job faster. It may be as simple as waiting for help to arrive or assisting an injured worker. It can also be planning how to safely shut off a valve, plug a leak, or contain the hazardous spill. It's always better to get help if you aren't trained or equipped to deal with the hazard. Number eight, get proper equipment and materials. Whenever you're not sure of the chemical, wear the maximum protection possible that means a self-contained breathing apparatus and full protective clothing. Wear it for gases, liquids, solids, everything. If you know the material and its properties, you can select other protection for handling spills. Boots, gloves, safety glasses, goggles, face shields, hard hats, aprons, splash suits, and fully encapsulated suits can be used. Be sure you have the right protection for the emergency. Number nine, contain the spill. Once you have the proper protection, you want to keep the hazardous spill from spreading. You want to minimize the danger to yourself, other people, the facility, and the environment. The faster you can contain the spill, the less danger there will be. Containment really means two things, stopping the source and stopping the spread. Stopping the source of the leak or spill may only require closing a valve or shutting down a pump to stop the flow. It may mean putting a suitable bandage on a leaking hose or stuffing a rag or crude boiler patch on the leak. To minimize leakage in torn or punctured containers, 
You can orient the container so the chemical doesn't escape. Stopping the spread is the second part of containment procedures. Building barriers so the spiller leak can't spread. Making a flow channel to control the spread. It's important that the hazardous material doesn't reach a water source where it could contaminate the water supply or lakes or rivers. Diking materials such as sorbent brooms, sorbent sheets or pillows should be used to prevent the spill from spreading. You can plug a drain with a specially made drain plug or shop rag or use sorbent brooms to keep the material from reaching the drain. To keep gases, vapors, and mists from spreading to the rest of the facility, shut down the ventilating or air conditioning system if appropriate. Number 10, clean up the spill. As you are physically cleaning up the hazardous material, use common sense. Don't touch or taste the material. Don't breathe gases, vapors, or mists. Use the right clothing and equipment, and always approach a spill from upwind. Don't smoke or make sparks of any kind. The next thing about cleanup is to use the right sorbent for the spill. Sorbents are items such as sorbent snakes, absorbent blankets, pillows, and brooms. All have different performance characteristics, and it's important to select the right sorbent products in advance for the liquids to be cleaned up. Absorb the spilled material with appropriate sorbents and place the contaminated sorbents in a container that can safely hold and store the spilled material. One thing about clay chips and sawdust. These items may seem more cost effective than packaged sorbent materials. However, when you compare the costs of the clay or sawdust, be sure to add in the cost of storage, labeling, handling, cleanup, and hazardous waste disposal. Also, add in the fact that rarely can you recover any of the spilled material through recycling. Packaged sorbent materials are much more cost effective, cleanup costs are much less, and recovery of the spilled material is a reality. We strongly recommend packaged sorbent materials over the old method of using clay chips or sawdust. After the spill has been contained and cleaned up, the sorbents you use to control the spill must be properly packaged according to local, state, and federal regulations. Absorbed materials have the same properties and hazards as the original spilled materials, and they may be dangerous, so treat them with care. Safely dispose of all disposable coveralls, gloves, and respirators. Decontaminate all non-disposable items, such as shovels, scrapers, respirators, self-contained breathing apparatus, protective clothing, and even vehicles or other equipment used in the cleanup. Review what happened to make sure it won't happen again and evaluate your emergency plan and what you did, what worked, what didn't work. How could it have been done better? No matter how small the spill, you want to have a record of what happened to take corrective action to prevent similar spills or leaks in the future. Plans and preparations, along with practiced responses to spills, should be accomplished in advance of an emergency. Time is the best way to contain a spill. By reacting quickly, spills can be kept under control and damage minimized. Thank you.